It began with the day when it was almost the 5th of November, and a doubt arose as to the quality of the fireworks laid in for the Guy Fawkes celebration. As it was raining, the four children decided to test a doubtful jack-in-the-box on a tray on the nursery floor. It finally caught fire at the 23rd match with such a desperate violence that Cyril and Robert had to smother it with the nursery carpet, which itself began to move with such a terrible spluttering that Jane and Anthea burst into tears. Next moment, Mother rushed in. The fact that the nursery carpet was ruined occasioned but little surprise. Nor was anyone really astonished that bed should prove the immediate end of the adventure. The rest of the fireworks were confiscated, and the Guy Fawkes celebration cancelled. Next day, Mother went out to the Kentish Town Road and returned with a rolled-up carpet. As the carpet was unrolled across the nursery floor, something hard bumped out and trundled along to Cyril's feet. It was shaped like an egg, and it had an odd sort of light in it, as though it had a yoke of pale fire that just showed through the stone. The stone egg was put on the mantelpiece, where it quite brightened up the nursery. On the 5th of November, father and mother went to the theatre. The children were not happy. When the baby had been put to bed, they sat sadly round the fire in the nursery. "'I'm beastly bored,' said Robert. "'Last holidays we found a Samiad and had lots of adventures. "'I mean, why has it all got to stop?' "'The Samiad is a sand fairy, and it let the children have anything they wished for. "'What I want is for something to happen now,' said Cyril. "'I wish they taught magic at school,' Jane sighed. If we could do a little magic, it might make something happen. A spell with a magic fire of sweet-smelling wood and magic gums and things. We could always burn some of the eucalyptus oil we have for our coals, said Anthea. And I've got my cedar wood pencils, said Robert. When the fire was lit in the nursery grate, it certainly smelt very strong and looked very magical, but still nothing happened. The children fetched tea cloths from the kitchen and waved them wildly about their heads, and still nothing happened, till Robert's cloth caught the golden egg and whisked it off the mantelpiece. The egg fell into the red-hot heart of the nursery fire. "'Oh, crikey!' said Robert. "'At least it's not smashed,' said Cyril. "'Look at it!' Anthea was kneeling down. "'I do believe something is going to happen.' The egg was glowing, and inside it something was moving. Next moment there was a soft cracking sound. The egg burst in two, and out of it came a flame-coloured bird. As it rested among the flames, the children watched it begin to grow bigger and bigger. "'Which of you?' it said. "'Put the egg into the fire.' "'He did,' said three voices, and three fingers pointed at Robert. The bird bowed. I am your grateful debtor, it said with a high-bred air. I believe I know who you are, said Robert. You are the phoenix. The bird was pleased. My fame has lived then for two thousand years, it said. You're in lots of books, said Robert. Cyril pulled out volume ten of the encyclopedia, and on page 246 he found the following. Phoenix, fabulous bird of antiquity, about the size of a small eagle with feathers of a gold colour and eyes that sparkle like stars. When advanced in age, the phoenix burns itself, and from the ashes arises a worm. A worm? The phoenix ruffled its feathers. That is a vulgar insult. The phoenix has an egg, like all respectable birds. Every five hundred years it makes a pile and it lays its egg and burns itself. And it goes to sleep and wakes up in its egg and comes out and goes on living again and so forever and ever. I can't tell you how weary I got of it. But how did your egg get here? asked Anthea. Well, said the phoenix, to cut about seventy long stories short, it was getting near the time to lay the egg, when into my wilderness on a magic carpet came a prince and princess. They were so fond of each other that they did not want anyone else, and as they meant to stay, they had no further use for the carpet, so they gave it to me. 
so I laid my egg on the carpet and told it to take the egg somewhere where it couldn't be hatched for two thousand years, and where, when that time's up, someone will light a fire of sweet wood and aromatic gums and put the egg in to hatch. And you see, it's all come out exactly as I said. The phoenix pointed its claw at the grate. But the carpet, said Robert, the magic carpet that takes you anywhere you wish. What became of that? Oh, that, said the phoenix carelessly. I should say that that is the carpet. I remember the pattern perfectly. It pointed as it spoke to the floor, where lay the carpet. Which mother had bought in the Kentish Town Road for twenty-two shillings and ninepence. At that instant, father's latch key was heard in the door. Bother! Groaned Cyril. Now we shall catch it for not being in bed. Wish yourself there, said the phoenix, and then wish the carpet back in its place. No sooner said than done. It made one a little giddy, certainly, and a little breathless. But when things seemed right way up again, there the children were in bed. And the lights were out. I shall sleep on the cornice above your curtains," whispered the phoenix. "Please don't mention me to your kinsfolk. Not much good," said Robert. "They'd never believe us if we did." Next morning, the children sat down on the carpet. Where shall we go? Was of course the question. Japan, America, the seaside. I vote we let the phoenix decide," said Robert. We want to go somewhere abroad," they said, "and we can't make up our minds where." "Let the carpet make up its mind," said the phoenix. "Just say you wish to go abroad." So they did, and the next moment, the world seemed to spin upside down, and when it was right way up again, they were out of doors, floating steadily in the crisp, clean air, and far below were the diamonded waves of the sea. In front of them lay land. The coast of France," said the phoenix. "Where do you wish to go? I shall always keep one wish, of course, for emergencies. Otherwise, you may get into an emergency from which you can't emerge at all." <laughs> "We'll stop as soon as we see a nice place," said Anthea. "I expect the phoenix can speak French." Ahead of them now were some ruined walls on a hill. And a great square tower. The top of that's just exactly the same size as the carpet," said Jane. "We could stop there, hide the carpet, and go out and get things to eat. I just wish the carpet would fit itself in at the top of that tower." The carpet made a disconcerting bound, and next moment it was hovering above the square top of the tower. Then slowly it began to sink under them. It was like a lift going down. I don't think we ought to wish things without all agreeing to them first," said Robert huffishly. "Hello, what on earth?" For unexpectedly and greyly, something was coming up all round the four sides of the carpet. It was as if a wall were being built by magic quickness. "We're dropping into the tower!" Anthea screamed. "There wasn't any top to it." Robert sprang to his feet. "We ought to have, hello, an owl's nest." He put his knee on a jutting piece of grey stone and leaned in to the deep window slit to take a better look. "Look sharp!" cried everyone, but Robert did not look sharp enough. When he had twisted round, the carpet had sunk eight feet below him. "Jump, you silly cuckoo!" cried Cyril. But by the time he was ready to jump, the walls of the tower had risen up thirty feet above the others, who were still sinking with the carpet. The situation. Was terrible. As soon as the carpet came to a stop at the bottom of the tower, it spread itself limply over the loose stones and little earthy mounds, just like any ordinary carpet. I wish we hadn't come," said Jane. "You always do," said Cyril briefly. "Look here, we can't leave Robert up there. I wish the carpet would fetch him down." The carpet seemed to awake from a dream and pull itself together. The children watched as the carpet floated back up. And then down again, it threw itself on the uneven floor, and as it did so, it tumbled Robert out. Oh, glory! Said Robert, "I've had about enough for a bit. Let's wish ourselves at home again and have a go at some jam tart and mutton." Righto," said everyone.
for the adventure had shaken the nerves of all. So they all got onto the carpet again and said, I wish we were at home. And lo and behold, they were no more at home than before. The carpet never moved. The phoenix had taken the opportunity to go to sleep. Anthea woke it up gently. Look here, she said. We wish to be at home, and we're still here. I did tell you, you know, said the phoenix. Only you are fond of listening to the music of your own voices. You did tell us what, interrupted Cyril. Why, that the carpet only gives you three wishes a day, and you've had them. There was a heartfelt silence. Then how are we going to get home, said Cyril at last. I haven't any idea, replied the phoenix. But can't you give wishes, asked Robert. Oh, dear me, no, said the phoenix. I'm not a carpet. But we shan't be home before Mother is, said Cyril. I do wish we hadn't come, said Jane. And everyone else said shut up, except Anthea. Dear phoenix, she began, I believe you can help us. Oh, I do wish you would. The phoenix walked up and down the carpet for a few minutes in deep thought. Then it drew itself up proudly. I can help you, it said. You won't mind my leaving you for an hour or two. And without waiting for a reply, it soared up through the dimness of the tower into the brightness above. It was not till it had quite gone that Jane said, Suppose it never comes back. It was not a pleasant thought. But curiously enough, there was no door to the tower. But in one of the corners was a heap of stones which partly concealed a hole. I say, said Robert, there's a sort of tunnel in here. Come on. Next moment, everyone was helping to pull down the heap of stones till the hole was large enough to crawl through. It was lucky that Cyril had brought along his box of matches. The first match flared up. There's some steps. There were seventeen and at the bottom were more passages and a sort of low arch. Cyril lit another match. There's something in here. He reached in the arch and pulled out a rotten bag, and golden coins ran and clinked onto the floor of the dark passage. I wonder what you would say if you suddenly came upon buried treasure. What Cyril said was, Oh, bother, I've burnt my fingers. And as he spoke, he dropped the last match. Jane began to cry. We can get out all right, said Anthea. But that was not so easy, for no one could remember exactly which way they had come. Despair was making the darkness blacker than ever, when quite suddenly the floor seemed to tip up, and a strong sensation of being in a lift came upon everyone. When the whirling feeling stopped and they opened their eyes, they were back in their own nursery at home. The carpet lay on the floor, and on the mantelpiece stood the phoenix. But how did you do it? they asked when everyone had thanked the phoenix again and again. I got a wish from your friend the Samiad, said the phoenix. The carpet told me where to find it. It was not till after the cold mutton and jam tart that anyone found time to regret the golden treasure. Never mind, said Anthea, we'll go back again and get it all. But we don't know where it is, said Cyril. Don't you know? Jane asked the phoenix. Not in the least, the phoenix replied. Then we've lost the treasure, said Robert. And they had. But at least we've got the carpet and the phoenix, said Anthea. <clears throat> Excuse me, said the bird, with an air of wounded dignity. But surely you must mean the phoenix and the carpet. The phoenix has hatched from the golden egg that rolled from the second-hand carpet that Mother had bought from the shop in the Kentish Town Road. The carpet is a wishing carpet, and the children know as well as you that the adventures are only just beginning. It was on a Saturday that the children made their first glorious journey on the wishing carpet. It was on the Sunday that the cook threatened to hand in her notice. It's the children, she said, there's that new carpet in their room, covered thick with mud, both sides, and sakes alive knows where they got it, and all that muck to clean up on a Sunday. I'm very sorry, said Mother gently. We will speak to the children. 
Jane's candid explanation that the mud had come from the bottom of a foreign tower where there was buried treasure was received with such chilling disbelief that the others limited their defence to an expression of sorrow and of a determination not to do it again. But father said that children who coated a carpet on both sides with thick mud were not fit to have a carpet at all, and indeed shouldn't have one for a week. Never mind, said Anthea, we've got the phoenix. But as it happened, they hadn't. The phoenix was nowhere to be found. Sunday ended in a damp brown gloom. Cook's a cantankerous cat, said Robert. It was a very long week, what with no carpet, no phoenix, and the poor baby had developed such a horrid cough that Cook said it was whooping cough as sure as eggs. At last it was Saturday, and the carpet was restored. There had been plenty of time to decide where it should be asked to go. They would ask it to go somewhere where you can't have whooping cough, and they would take the lamb with them. Lamb was the name they had given the baby because the first thing he ever said was ba. They dressed the lamb in his outdoors clothes. Then, while Anthea rushed through the house in one last wild hunt for the missing phoenix, they moved the chairs and table off the carpet. It's no use, she said, but I know it hasn't deserted us. It's a bird of its word. Quite so, said the gentle voice of the phoenix from beneath the table. Everyone fell on its knees and looked up, and there was the phoenix perched on the crossbar of wood. I've been here all the time, said the phoenix, yawning politely. If you wanted me, you should have recited the Ode of Invocation. It's 7,000 lines long and written in Greek. Couldn't you tell it us in English? asked Cyril. Couldn't you make a short version? asked Jane. Oh, come along, do, said Robert, holding out his hand. Come along, good old phoenix. Good old beautiful phoenix, it corrected. Good old beautiful phoenix, then. Come along, come along. The phoenix fluttered at once onto his wrist. This amiable youth, it said to the others, has miraculously been able to put the whole meaning of the 7,000 lines of Greek invocation into one English hexameter. A little misplaced some of the words, but... Uh, oh, do hurry up, good old beautiful phoenix, said Cyril. We shall have to get back before dinner, or Cook will blow the gaff. She hasn't sneaked since Sunday, said Anthea. She... Robert was beginning when the door burst open and the cook, fierce and furious, came in like a whirlwind and stood on the corner of the carpet, with a broken basin in one hand and a threat in the other, which was clenched. Look here, she cried, my only steak and kidney pudding basin. I'm awfully sorry, cook, said Anthea gently. It was my fault and I meant to tell you. Meant to tell me? Meant to tell me? You don't deserve no dinners, so you don't. Dear gracious cats alive, what have you got that blessed child dressed up in his outdoors for? We aren't going to take him out, said Anthea. At least, out? I'll take care you don't take him out. Red in face, the cook snatched the lamb from the lap of Jane, while Anthea and Robert caught her by the skirts and apron. It was at that moment the cook spotted the phoenix. Even Anthea realised that unless the cook lost her situation... The loss would be theirs. There was nothing for it. I wish, said Anthea, I wish we were on a sunny southern shore where there can't be any whooping cough. She said it through the frightened howls of the lamb and the sturdy scoldings of the cook, and instantly the giddy-go-round and falling lift feeling swept over the whole party, and the cook sat down flat on the carpet, holding the screaming lamb tight. The moment the whirling feeling stopped, the cook opened her eyes, gave one sounding screech and shut them again, and Anthea took the opportunity to get the howling lamb into her own arms. It's all right, she said. Look at the trees and the sand and the shells and the great big turtles waddling into the sea. Goodness, how hot it is. It certainly was, for the trusty carpet had laid itself out on a southern shore, 
besides which the greenest of green slopes led up to glorious groves where palm trees and tropical fruits and flowers were growing in rich profusion. Everyone tore off their London in November outdoor clothes. Even the shoes and socks came off, and there stood the lamb, digging his happy naked pink toes into the golden smooth sand. The cook suddenly opened her eyes and screamed, shut them, screamed again, opened her eyes once more, and said, Why, it's a dream! Well, it's the best I ever dreamed, seaside and trees and a carpet to sit on. Look here, said Cyril, it isn't a dream, it's real. Oh, yes, said the cook. Calm yourself, my good woman, said the phoenix. Yellow fowls are talking. I never thought to see the day. Well, then, said Cyril impatiently, sit here and see the day now. It's a jolly fine day. Here, you others, a council. They walked along the shore till they were out of earshot of the cook. Look here, said Cyril. The lamb can be getting rid of his whooping cough all the morning, and we can look about. And if the people on this island aren't friendly, we can take the cook back. And if they are friendly, we'll leave her here. Well, said Anthea, the safest thing is to leave the carpet there with her sitting on it. We can take turns to carry the lamb. And so the party of explorers prepared to enter the interior. It was the phoenix, circling high above, that spotted the path. Now the children went on through the wood more quickly and comfortably, and all this time the lamb hadn't whooping coughed once. The path twisted and turned, till suddenly they passed a corner and found themselves in a forest clearing where there were a lot of pointed huts. Hadn't we better go back, said Jane. Suppose the people here are cannibals. Nonsense, said Cyril. At that moment, a tall man carrying a spear came out of one of the huts. He looked at the children and uttered a shout. At once, more people came out of the huts. Jane, convinced she was about to be eaten, swallowed a scream, turned and fled back along the forest path, with Anthea and Cyril running behind. Robert, whose turn it was to carry the lamb, brought up the rear. The lamb was screaming with delight. But it wasn't the lamb that Jane heard. In her ears thundered the patter of hundreds of bare feet, belonging to several hundreds of hungry cannibals. Into the sea, she gasped. Cyril and Anthea paused on the water's edge. There were basking turtles on the sand, but no cook, no clothes, and no carpet. Look, said the phoenix. Cyril and Anthea turned, and there, a little to the west, was a head, a head they knew with a crooked cap upon it. It was the head of the cook. The people from the huts were now also gathered at the water's edge, and all were pointing with interest, not at the children, nor even at the delightful lamb, but were pointing at the head of the cook. "'What on earth are you doing out there?' Robert shouted. "'And where on earth's the carpet?' "'It's not on earth,' replied the cook happily. "'It's under me, in the water. "'I got a bit warm sitting out there in the sun, "'and I just says, I wish I was in a cold bath, just like that, "'and next minute, here I was.' "'Excuse me,' said the phoenix's soft voice. But I think these people from the hut want your cook. Anthea went pale. They want to eat her. Hardly, rejoined the bird. They wish to engage her. I advise you to beach the carpet and land the cargo. The cook, I mean. You can take my word for it. The people of these southern shores will not harm her. The children splashed into the warm water and at once got hold of the corners of the carpet and towed it slowly through the shallowing water, and at last spread it on the sand. The cook, who had followed, instantly sat down on it, and at once the hut people formed a ring round the carpet. The tallest man spoke in a language which only the phoenix could understand. Uh, he says they wish to engage your cook permanently as a queen. Well, said Cyril, there's no accounting for tastes. <clears throat> it seems continued the phoenix, that they have no choice, for there is an ancient prophecy that a queen should some day arise out of the sea with a white crown on her head, and, uh, and, well, you see, there's the crown. It pointed its claw at Cook's cap, 
and a very dirty cap it was. That's the white crown, it said. <clears throat> At least it's nearly white. Cyril addressed the cook. Would you really like to stay? Or if you promise not to be so jolly aggravating at home, we'll take you back to Camden Town. No, you don't, said the cook in firm, undoubting tones. I've always thought what a good queen I should make. If it's only a dream, it's well worth while. Some of the hut people now advanced from the forest with long garlands of beautiful flowers, white and sweet-scented. Well, so long, said the cook, getting heavily onto her feet. No more kitchens and attics for me, thank you. I'm off to my royal palace, I am. I only wish this dream would keep on forever and ever. <laughs> the cook picked up the end of one of the garlands, and the children had one last glimpse of her worn, elastic side boots before she disappeared into the shadow of the forest, surrounded by the hut people who were laughing and singing as they went. Oh, do please, let's get home, said Jane. The lamb was furiously unwishful to be dressed in his warm clothes again, but Anthea managed it by force disguised as coaxing, and he never once whooping coughed. Then everyone took its place on the carpet, and Anthea said, Home! And in one whirling moment, the carpet laid itself down in its proper place on the nursery floor. At that very moment, Eliza the housemaid opened the door and said, Cook's gone! I can't find her anywhere. You'll have to put up with cold bacon while I slip out see if they know anything about her at the police station. But nobody ever knew anything about the cook any more, except the children, the phoenix, and the carpet. Mother was so upset at losing the cook, and so anxious about her, that Anthea felt most miserable, as though she'd done something very wrong indeed. But at least the lamb had not coughed since their return. It was on Monday morning, very early indeed, that Anthea woke and suddenly made up her mind. She crept downstairs in her nightgown, sat on the carpet, and with a beating heart wished herself on the sunny shore where you can't have whooping cough. And next moment, there she was. Well, here you are again, said the cook, directly she saw Anthea. This dream does keep on. The cook was dressed in a white robe. She had no shoes and stockings and no cap, and she was sitting under a screen of palm leaves. She wore a flower wreath on her hair. Are you happy? asked Anthea. Love a duck, yes, said the cook queen. I'm teaching them the cooking, and they're teaching me the language. It's quite easy to pick up. Then you don't want for anything? Anthea asked earnestly and anxiously. Not me, except if you'd only go away. Long as this dream keeps up, I'm as happy as a queen. Goodbye, then, said Anthea gaily, for her conscience was clear now. She hurried into the wood, threw herself on the ground and said, Home! And there she was, rolled in the carpet on the nursery floor. She's all right, anyhow, said Anthea, and went back to bed. I'm glad somebody's pleased. But Mother would never believe me if I told her which, of course, was quite true, for no mother could ever believe in the phoenix and the carpet. Anthea, whose inside mind was made so that she was able to be much more uncomfortable than the others at keeping the great secret of the wishing carpet and the phoenix, has decided that she must tell her mother the truth. Mother was really a great dear, but... As the phoenix had told the children, she would never believe the story of the disappearing cook. You see, began Anthea when she had found her mother alone at the writing desk, the carpet took us to a place where you couldn't have whooping cough, and that's why the lamb hasn't hooped since. And we took the cook because she was so tiresome, and then she would stay and be queen on account of her white cap. Mother laid down her pen. I am most awfully busy, she sighed. This is a letter to your aunt at Lyndhurst, for tomorrow I am taking the lamb to Bournemouth on account of his cough, and as Daddy's got to go to Scotland, I'm leaving you with the new cook and Eliza till it is time for you to go to Lyndhurst, where Daddy and I shall meet you all for Christmas. Now please, no more talk about the phoenix, for my head's going round, and I really do wish you would take yourself off on this wishing carpet of yours. We shan't be able to go anywhere on the carpet when we're at Lyndhurst, said Robert. And I'm glad of it, said Jane, unexpectedly. Glad? 
said Cyril. Glad? It was breakfast time. The house felt very empty now that mother and the lamb and father were gone away. Yes, I'm glad, said Jane. I don't want any more fancy things to happen just now. I want everything to be just real. If we could only have got mother to believe it, we might have taken her to the jolliest places, said Cyril. We're going to Lindhurst tomorrow anyhow, said Robert. Don't let's waste the day in saying how horrid it is to keep secrets from mother. Let's get on the carpet and have one jolly good wish before Christmas. Well, look here, said Anthea. Couldn't we wish the carpet to take us somewhere where we should have the chance to do some good and kind action? It would be an adventure just the same. I don't mind, said Cyril. We shan't know where we're going and that'll be exciting. We might rescue a traveller buried in the snow like St Bernard dogs with barrels round our necks, said Jane, beginning to be interested. When breakfast was cleared away, Anthea swept the carpet and the children sat down on it together with the phoenix, who'd been especially invited to witness the good and kind action they were about to do. Four children and one bird were ready and the wish was wished. Everyone closed its eyes so as to feel the topsy-turvy swirl of the carpet's movement as little as possible. When the eyes were opened again, the children found themselves on the carpet, and the carpet was in its proper place on the floor of their own nursery at Camden Town. I say, said Cyril, here's a go. Do you think it's worn out? The wishing part, I mean, Robert anxiously asked the phoenix. It's not that, said the phoenix. Oh, I see what it means, said Robert with deep disgust. It's like the end of a fairy story in a Sunday magazine. How perfectly beastly. You mean it means we can do kind and good actions where we are. I see. I suppose it wants us to be nice to the new cook. Well, look here, Cyril spoke firmly. We want to go somewhere really interesting where we have a chance of doing something good and kind. We don't want to do it here, see? Now then. The obedient carpet started instantly, and the four children and one bird fell in a heap together, and as they fell, they were plunged in perfect darkness. "'Are you all there?' said Anthea breathlessly through the black dark. Everyone owned that it was there. "'Where are we? Ugh, I'll put my hand in a puddle. Has anyone got any matches?' It was then that Robert drew out of his pocket a box of matches, struck a match, and lighted a candle." Two candles. Well done, Bobs, said his sisters. I've always carried them about ever since the Lone Tower Day, said Robert with modest pride. I knew we should want them some day. Bobs, said Anthea suddenly, do you know where we are? This is the underground passage, and look there, there's the money and the money bags and everything. It seems an odd place to do good and kind acts in, though, said Jane. There's no one to do them to. Don't you be too sure, said Cyril. Just round the next turning we might find a prisoner who's languished here for years and years and we could take him out on our carpet and restore him to his sorrowing friends. Of course we could, said Robert, standing up. Or we might find the bones of a poor prisoner and take them to his friends to be buried properly. I wish you wouldn't, said Jane. I know exactly where we shall find the bones too, Robert went on. You see that dark arch just along the passage? Jane had opened her mouth to scream when the golden voice of the phoenix spoke through the gloom. Peace, it said. There are no bones here except the small but useful sets that you have inside you. And you did not invite me to come with you to hear you talk about bones, but to see you do some good and kind action. We can't do it here said Robert, sulkily. It was Cyril who suggested that perhaps they had better take the money and go. That wouldn't be a kind act except to ourselves, said Anthea. We might take it and spend it on the poor and aged, said Cyril. That wouldn't make it right to steal, said Anthea stoutly. That's right, said Robert. Stand here all day arguing while the candles burn out. You like it awfully when it's all dark again and bony. So they rolled up the carpet and went. But when they had crept along to the place where the passage led into the topless tower, they found the way blocked by a great stone which they could not move. There, said Robert, I hope you're satisfied. Everything has two ends, 
said the phoenix softly, even a quarrel or a secret passage. So they turned round and went back. The passage was long, and there were arches and steps and turnings and dark alcoves. It ended in a flight of steps. Robert went up them. Suddenly he staggered heavily back onto the following feet of Jane, and everybody screamed. Oh, what is it? I've only bashed my head in, said Robert. The stairs go right slap into the ceiling, and it's a stone ceiling. You can't do good and kind actions underneath a paving stone. If it's a trap door, said Cyril, pushing past Robert, yes, there's a bolt. Uh, I can't move it. By a happy chance, Cyril had in his pocket the oil can of his father's bicycle. He put the carpet down and he lay on his back. He oiled the bolt till the drops of rust and oil fell down on his face. One even went into his mouth. Then he and Robert pulled, and suddenly the bolt gave way with a rusty scrunch, and they all rolled together to the bottom of the stairs, all but the phoenix, who had taken to its wings when the pulling began. Nobody was hurt much, and now indeed the shoulders of the boys were used to some purpose, for the stone allowed them to heave it up. Back it fell with a bang. Everyone climbed out into the dazzling daylight. But there was not room for everyone to stand comfortably in the little paved house where they found themselves, so when the phoenix had fluttered up from the darkness, they let the stone down, and it closed like a trap door, as indeed it was. The place where they were in was a little shrine, built on the side of a road that went winding up through yellow green fields to the topless tower. The shrine was a kind of tiny chapel with no front wall. Just a place for travellers to stop and rest and wish to be good, so the phoenix told them. But what is the good and kind action the carpet brought us here to do? asked Anthea. I think it would be kind to find the owners of the treasure and tell them about it, said Cyril. And give it them all, said Jane. Yes, but whose is it? I should go to the first house and ask the name of the owner of the castle, said the golden bird. And really, the idea seemed a good one. They dusted themselves down as well as they could, and went down the road. The first house they came to was a little white house with green shutters and a slate roof. The children walked up to the front door, and Cyril pulled the bell. "My hat," he breathed. "We don't know any French." At this moment, the door opened. A very tall, lean lady with pale ringlets stood before them. Her eyes were small and grey. And not pretty, for the rims were red as though she had been crying. She addressed the party in something that sounded like a foreign language. What does she say? Robert asked, looking down into the hollow of his jacket where the phoenix was nestling. But before the phoenix could answer, the lady's face was lighted up by a most charming smile. You are from England, she cried. I love so much the England. Mais entrez, entrez donc tous. We only want to ask. I shall say all that you wish," said the lady. "Enter only." So they all went in, wiping their feet on a very clean mat, and putting the carpet in a safe corner of the veranda. The most beautiful days of my life," said the lady, "did pass themselves in England." There was a wood fire. Very small and very bright, the room was extremely bare, but for the polished table at the end of which a little boy sat in a high-backed, uncomfortable-looking chair. Oh, how pretty! Said everyone, but no one meant the boy. What everyone admired was a little Christmas tree hung around with tiny candles. Sit down, you then, and let us see," said the lady. Then there was a struggle in the breast of Robert, and out fluttered the phoenix. Spread his gold wings, flew to the top of the Christmas tree, and perched there. Ah! cried the lady, "It will burn itself." It won't, thank you," said Robert. And the little French boy clapped his hands. But the lady was so anxious that the phoenix fluttered down and walked up and down on the shiny walnut wood table. Is it that your little parakeet talks? asked the lady. And the phoenix replied in excellent French. It said, "Parfaitement, Madame." Then in English, "Why are you so sad near Christmas time?" At this, of course, the lady began to cry again. 
I am sorry we came when you were so sad, said Anthea, but we really only wanted to ask you, whose is that castle on the hill? Oh, my little angel, said the poor lady, sniffing. Today and for hundreds of years the castle is to us, to our family. Tomorrow it must that I sell it to some strangers, and my little Henri here will not have the lands paternel. How would you feel if you found a lot of money, hundreds and thousands of gold pieces? asked Cyril. The lady smiled. Ah, one has already recounted to you the legend. It is told that one of our ancestors has hid a treasure of gold, enough to enrich my little Henri for the life. Tell her what you have found, whispered the phoenix. It's no use explaining how we got in said Robert, when he had told her of the finding of the treasure, because you would find it a little difficult to understand and much more difficult to believe, but we can show you where the gold is and help you to fetch it away. And so they all went up the hill to the wayside shrine. The boys prized the stone up and Robert went first. They found the golden treasure exactly as they had left it, and everyone was flushed with the joy of performing such a wonderfully kind action. Then the lady and the little boy clasped hands and wept for joy, calling the children Garden Angels, and talked very fast and both together. Get away now, said the phoenix softly. So the children crept away and out through the little shrine. The Garden Angels ran down the hill to the lady's little house, where they had left the carpet on the veranda. They took the carpet into the little field behind the house, where they spread it out and said, Home! And no one saw them disappear, except for the French lady's milk cow, which at the very moment of the children saying, Home, planted one of its large and friendly hooves on the edge of the carpet. There was a terrible tearing sound. Back in the nursery in Camden Town, the children examined the carpet. At one corner a strip was torn, and it hung forlornly. Never mind, said Cyril when they talked over their adventure at tea time. Today's been the best thing we've done. And in future, said Anthea, we'll only do kind actions with the carpet. <coughs> said the phoenix. I beg your pardon, said Anthea. Oh, nothing, said the bird. I was only thinking. The carpet has done many wonders in its day. But if only the children had taken off their shoes. When you hear that the children spent an uneventful Christmas at their aunt's house in Lyndhurst, you will not be surprised to learn that on their return they spent the rest of their school holidays with the phoenix and the wishing carpet, enjoying adventures which included 199 greying Persian cats, 398 squeaking muskrats, and an honest burglar who was persuaded to give up his life of crime for marriage with the cook queen on the sunny shore where you can't have whooping cough. I would like you to try to believe in these adventures, for it might help explain why, when we next meet the children, with cautious tenderness, they are holding the carpet up to the light. Good gracious, said Jane, the carpet is wearing out. Its life with you has not been a luxurious one, said the phoenix, French mud twice, sand, cow's hoof, cats and rats. We must mend it, said Anthea. So out they all went and bought wool to mend the carpet. But there is no shop in Camden Town where you can buy wishing wool. No, nor in Kentish Town either. However, ordinary Scotch heather mixture seemed good enough, and this they bought, and all that day Jane and Anthea darned and darned and darned and the gentle phoenix paced up and down the table and talked to the industrious girls about their carpet. It is not an ordinary, ignorant carpet from Kidderminster, it said. It is a carpet with a past, a Persian past. Do you know that in happier years, when that carpet was the property of caliphs, kings and sultans, it never lay on the floor? I thought the floor was the proper home of a carpet, Jane interrupted. Not of a magic carpet said the phoenix. Why, if it had been allowed to lie about on floors, there wouldn't be much of it left now. No, indeed, it has lived in the sandalwood caskets of princesses and in the rose-scented treasure houses of kings. 
Never, never had anyone degraded it by walking on it, except in the way of business, when wishes were required, and then they always took their shoes off. And you... Oh, don't, said Jane, very near tears. You know you'd never have been hatched at all if it hadn't been for Mother wanting a carpet for us to walk on. You needn't have walked so much or so hard, said the bird. Well, I must say, Mother said, looking at the wishing carpet as it lay, all darned and mended, I must say I've never in my life bought such a bad bargain as that carpet. Well, never mind, darlings, you've done your best. I think we'll have coconut matting next time. But now, away with melancholy, Father has sent a telegram. Look. She held it out, and the children read... Box for kiddies at Garrick Theatre. Meet Charing Cross, 6.30. That means, said Mother, that you're going to see the water babies all by your happy selves, and Father and I will take you and fetch you. When Mother had gone, the phoenix fluttered down and perched on the fender, and its conversation, as usual, was entertaining and instructive, like school prizes are said to be. But it seemed a little absent-minded, and even a little sad. Don't you feel well, Phoenix, dear? asked Anthea. I am not sick, replied the golden bird with a gloomy shake of the head, but I am getting old. Why, you've hardly been hatched any time at all, said Robert. Time, remarked the Phoenix, is measured by heartbeats. I'm sure the palpitations I've had since I've known you are enough to blanch the feathers of any bird. But I thought you lived for five hundred years. I have lived in these two months at a pace which generously counterbalances five hundred years of life in the desert, said the phoenix. I am old. I am weary. I feel as if I ought to lay my egg and lay me down to my fiery sleep. But unless I'm careful, I shall be hatched again instantly, and that is a misfortune which I really do not think I could endure. But do not let me intrude these desperate personal reflections on your youthful happiness. What is the show at the theatre tonight? Wrestlers? Gladiators? I don't think so, said Cyril. It's called The Water Babies, and if it's like the book, there isn't any gladiating in it. It's about chimney sweeps and children living in water, said Anthea. Mm, it sounds chilly, the phoenix shivered and went to sit on the tongs. I don't suppose there will be real water, said Jane, and theatres are very warm and pretty with a lot of gold and lamps. Wouldn't you like to come with us? That evening, the phoenix snugged inside Robert's waistcoat, a very tight fit it seemed both to Robert and to the phoenix, and was taken to the play. Father's parting words were, Now don't you stir out of this box, whatever you do. I shall be back before the end of the play. Be good, and you will be happy. Goodbye. Robert was at last able to remove his coat, mop his perspiring brow, and release the crushed and dishevelled phoenix. They were very, very early. When the lights went up fully, the phoenix, balancing itself on the gilded back of a chair, swayed in ecstasy. How fair a scene is this, it murmured. Tell me, my Robert, is not this a temple? You can call this your temple if you like, said Robert. But shh, the music is beginning. I'm not going to tell you about the play. What I must tell you is that, though Cyril and Jane and Robert and Anthea enjoyed it as much as any children possibly could, the pleasure of the phoenix was far, far greater than theirs. This is indeed my temple, it said again and again. What radiant rites, and all to do honour to me. The songs in the play it took to be hymns in its honour. The electric lights, it said, were magic torches lighted for its sake, and it was so charmed with the footlights that the children could hardly persuade it to sit still. But when the limelight was shown, it could contain its approval no longer. It flapped its golden wings and cried in a voice that could be heard all over the theatre, Well done, my servants! Ye have my favour and my countenance! the actor playing Little Tom stopped short in what he was saying. A deep breath was drawn by hundreds of lungs, every eye in the house turned to the box where the luckless children cringed, and most people hissed or said, shh, or turn them out. 
Then the play went on, and an attendant presently came to the box and spoke wrathfully. It wasn't us, indeed it wasn't, said Anthea truthfully. When the attendant had gone, the phoenix was quiet, but it kept whispering to the children. It wanted to know why there was no altar, no fire, no incense, and became so excited and fretful and tiresome that the four children wished deeply it had been left at home. What happened next was entirely the fault of the phoenix. It was balancing itself on the gilt back of the chair, swaying backwards and forwards, when it murmured warmly, No altar, no fire, no incense. And then, before any of the children could even begin to think of stopping it, it spread its bright wings and swept round the theatre, brushing its gleaming feathers against delicate hangings and gilded woodwork. It seemed to have made but one circular wing sweep. Next moment it was perched again on the chair back, and all round the theatre, where it had passed, little sparks shone like tinsel seeds. Then little smoke wreaths curled up like growing plants. Little flames opened like flower buds. People whispered. Then people shrieked. Fire! Fire! The curtain went down. The lights went up. Fire! cried everyone, and made for the doors. A magnificent idea, said the phoenix complacently. An enormous altar. Doesn't the incense smell delicious? The only smell was the stifling smell of smoke. The little flames had opened now into great flames. The people in the theatre were shouting and pressing towards the doors. Oh, how could you? cried Jane. Let's get out. Father said, stay here, said Anthea, very pale and trying to speak in her ordinary voice. He didn't mean stay and be roasted, said Robert. Cyril opened the door of the box, but a fierce waft of smoke and hot air made him shut it again. It was not possible to get out that way. They looked over the front of the box. Could they climb down? Look at the people, moaned Anthea. We couldn't get through. And indeed, the crowd round the doors looked as thick as flies in the jam-making season. I wish we'd never seen the phoenix, cried Jane. Even at that awful moment, Robert looked round to see if the bird had overheard a speech which, however natural, was hardly polite or grateful. But the phoenix was gone. Look here, said Robert. I'm not frightened. No, I'm not. The phoenix has never been a skunk yet, and I'm certain it'll see us through somehow. I believe in the phoenix. The phoenix thanks you, O oh Robert, said a golden voice at his feet. And there was the phoenix itself on the wishing carpet. Quick, it said, stand on those portions of the carpet which are truly antique and authentic, and... A sudden jet of flame stopped its words. Alas, the phoenix had unconsciously warmed to its subject, and in the unintentional heat of the moment had set fire to the newly darned pieces. The children tried to stamp them out, but when they had done so, only the fabric of the old carpet was left, and that was full of holes. Come, said the phoenix, I'm cool now. The four children got on to what was left of the carpet. Very careful they were not to leave a leg or a hand hanging over one of the holes. It was very hot. The theatre was a pit of fire. Everyone else had got out. Home, said Cyril. And instantly the cool draught from under the nursery door played upon their legs as they sat. They were all on the carpet still, and the carpet was lying in its proper place on the nursery floor, as calm and unmoved as though it had never been to the theatre or taken part in a fire in its life. Four long breaths of deep relief were instantly breathed. They were safe. And everyone else was safe. The theatre had been quite empty when they left. Everyone was sure of that. Suddenly, Anthea's face turned pale under the dirt which had collected on it during the fire. Oh! she cried. Mother and father! Oh, how awful! They'll think we're burned to cinders. Oh, let's go this minute and tell them we aren't. We should only miss them said the sensible Cyril. Oh, I wish we'd never got to know that phoenix, said Jane. Shh, said Robert. It's no use being rude to the bird. It can't help its nature. I vote we go and get washed. No one had noticed the phoenix since it had bidden them to step on the carpet, and no one noticed that no one had noticed. All were partially clean, 
and Cyril was just plunging into his greatcoat to go and look for his parents when the sound of father's latchkey in the front door sent everyone bounding into the hall. Are you all safe? cried mother's voice and the next moment she was kneeling on the linoleum trying to kiss four damp children at once while father stood looking on and saying he was blessed or something. But how did you guess we'd come home? said Cyril when everyone was calm enough for talking. Well, it was rather a rum thing. We heard the Garrick was on fire, and of course we went straight there, said Father. We couldn't find you, and we couldn't get in, but the fireman told us everyone was safely out. And then I heard a voice at my ear saying, Cyril, Anthea, Robert and Jane are safe at home. When I turned to see who it was speaking, hanged if there wasn't a great yellow pigeon. Dazed by the fire, I suppose. Your mother said <laughs> it was the bird that spoke. Robert had a talk to the phoenix that night. Oh, very well, said the bird when Robert had said what he felt. Didn't you know that I had power over fire? Do not distress yourself. I can undo the work of flames. Kindly open the casement. It flew out. That was why the papers said next day that the fire at the theatre had done less damage than had been anticipated. As a matter of fact, it had done none for the phoenix spent the night in putting things straight. How the management accounted for this, and how many of the theatre officials still believe that they were mad on that night, will never be known. Next day, Mother saw the burnt holes in the carpet. I must get rid of that carpet at once, she said. But what the children said in sad whispers to each other as they pondered over last night's events was, We must get rid of that phoenix. The four children feel like treacherous friends. Who should be the one to tell the phoenix that they could no longer be a place for it in that happy home in Camden Town? Anthea crept into Mother's room and set the tray on a chair. Then she pulled one of the blinds up very softly. I'm so sorry you've got a headache, she said. It's that horrible fire and you being so frightened. And we feel as if it was our faults. I can't explain, but it wasn't your fault a bit, you darling goose, Mother said. How could it be? That's just what I can't tell you, said Anthea. When Anthea rejoined the others, she found them all plunged in the gloom where she was herself, for everyone knew that the days of the carpet were now numbered. So that now, after nearly a month of magic happenings, the time was at hand when life would have to go on in the dull, ordinary way. Mother's going to send away the carpet as soon as she's well enough to see about that coconut matting. Fancy us with coconut matting. Us! And we've walked under live coconut trees on the island where you can't have whooping cough. Pity island, said their baby brother, who was called the lamb. They were talking about the carpet, but what they were thinking about was the phoenix. The golden bird had been so kind, so friendly, and now it had set fire to a theatre and made Mother ill. Nobody blamed the bird. It had acted in a perfectly natural manner, but everyone saw that it must not be asked to prolong its visit. Indeed, in plain English, it must be asked to go. They could not talk the whole thing over as they would have liked to do, because the phoenix itself was sitting on the fender of the nursery fire, preening its golden feathers. Pity birdie, remarked the lamb. Poor misguided infant, said the phoenix. Pity birdie, said the lamb. Go and show mummy. Mummy's asleep, said Jane hastily. But the lamb, crawling under the table, caught his feet and hands in the holes of the carpet so that the children had to move the table and there the carpet lay bare to sight with all its horrid holes. Ah, said the bird, it isn't long for this world. No, said Cyril, respectfully kicking what was left of the carpet. Everything comes to an end. The movement of its bright colours caught the eye of the lamb, who instantly began to pull at the red and blue threads. Agadi, dagadi, gagadi, murmured the lamb. And before anyone could have winked, the middle of the floor showed bare. The magic carpet was gone, and so was the lamb. There was a horrible silence. The lamb, the baby, all alone, 
had been wafted away on that untrustworthy carpet so full of holes and magic, and no one could follow him because there was now no carpet to follow on. But the lamb never wished, said Cyril. He was only talking bosh. The carpet understands all speech, said the phoenix, even bosh. Do you mean then, said Anthea, that when he was saying Agglety Dag or whatever it was, that he meant something by it? All speech has meaning, said the phoenix. And what did it mean? Unfortunately, the bird rejoined, I never studied bosh. Jane sobbed noisily, but the others were calm with what is sometimes called the calmness of despair. The lamb was gone. Gone into the great world with no other companion and protector than a carpet with holes in it. The children had never really understood before what an enormously big place the world is, and the lamb could be anywhere in it. Do you wish him to return? the phoenix asked. It seemed to speak with some surprise. Of course we do! cried everybody. Isn't he more trouble than he's worth? No! No, we want him back! We do! Then, said the wearer of gold plumage, if you'll excuse me, I'll just pop out and see what I can do. Cyril flung open the window, and the phoenix popped out. Oh, if only Mother goes on sleeping! And at this awful moment, Mother's bell rang. A breathless stillness held the children. The bell rang again. I must go, said Anthea, and she went. Yes, Mother, she said. Dearest, said Mother, the lamb... Anthea tried to be brave, but when she opened her mouth, no words came, so she stood with it open. The lamb, Mother went on, he was very good at first, but he's pulled the toilet cover off the dressing table, and now he's so quiet, I'm sure he's in some dreadful mischief, and I can't see him from here, and if I'd got out of bed to see, I'm sure I should have felt worse. Do you mean he's here? Of course he's here, said Mother, a little impatiently. Where did you think he was? Anthea went round the foot of the bed. He's not here now, she said. That he had been there was plain, from the scattered pots and bottles. He must have crept out then, said Mother. Do keep him with you, there's a darling. If I don't get some sleep, I shall be a wreck when your father comes home. Anthea closed the door softly. Then she tore downstairs and burst into the nursery. There, on the floor, lay the carpet, and on the carpet sat the lamb. He had covered his face with Vaseline and powder, but he was easily recognisable in spite of this disguise. Evidently, said the phoenix, who was also present, Agate Dag is bosh for I want to be where my mother is. And so the faithful carpet understood it. But how, said Anthea, catching up the lamb and hugging him, how did he get back here? Oh, said the phoenix, I flew to your sand fairy, the Samiad, and wished that your infant brother were restored to your midst, and immediately it was so. Oh, I am glad, I am glad, cried Anthea, still hugging the baby. Cyril, you and Robert roll that carpet up and put it in the cupboard. Two days later, Mother was well enough to go out, and that evening the coconut matting came home. The children had still not found any polite way of telling the phoenix that they did not want it to stay any longer. <coughs> I like not this carpet, the phoenix said. It is harsh and unyielding, and it hurts my golden feet. What have you done with the magic web? It's the rag and bone man's day tomorrow, said Anthea in a low voice. He will take it away. The phoenix fluttered up to its favourite perch on the chair back. Hear me, it cried, O oh, youthful children of men. Weep not. I really do beg that you won't weep. I will not seek to break the news to you gently. Let the blow fall at once. The time has come when I must leave you. All four children breathed forth a long sigh of relief. Ah, oh, sigh not so, said the bird, misunderstanding. All meetings end in partings. I must leave you. Ah, oh, do not give way. Must you really go so soon, murmured Anthea politely. I must really. Thank you so much, dear, replied the bird, 
I am weary. I desire to rest. After all the happenings of this last moon, I do desire greatly to rest, and I ask of you one last boon. Any little thing we can do, said Robert. I ask but the relic designed for the rag and bone man. Give me what is left of the carpet and let me go. Dare we, said Anthea, would mother mind? I have dared greatly for your sakes, remarked the bird. Well then, we will, said Robert. The phoenix fluffed out its feathers joyously. Nor shall you regret it, children of golden hearts, it said. Quick, spread the carpet and leave me alone. But first, pile high the fire. Then, while I am immersed in the sacred preliminary rites, do ye prepare sweet-smelling woods and spices for the last act of parting. The children spread out what was left of the carpet. And after all, though this was just what they would have wished to have happened, all hearts were sad. Then they put half a scuttle of coal on the fire and went out, closing the door on the phoenix. One of us must keep watch, said Robert, and the others can go and buy sweet woods and spices. Get the very best that money can buy, and plenty of them. Robert is right, Anthea said. This is no time for being careful about our money. Let's go to the stationers first and buy a whole packet of pencils. The people at the stationers said that the pencils were real cedar wood. Also, they bought a little sandalwood box. Because, said Anthea, I know sandalwood smells sweet. At the grocer's they bought all the spices they could remember the names of. Camphor and oil of lavender were bought at the chemist's, and also a little scent sachet labelled Violette de Palme. They took the things home, and when they had knocked, the golden voice of the phoenix had said, Come in, and in they went. There lay the carpet, or what was left of it, and on it lay an egg, exactly like the one out of which the phoenix had been hatched. Ah! <laughs> I've laid it, you see, and as fine an egg as ever I laid in all my born days. The things which the children had bought were now taken out of their papers and arranged on the table, and the phoenix was quite overcome. Never, never have I had a finer pyre than this will be. You shall not regret it, it said, wiping away a golden tear. Take a piece of paper and write what I tell you. Robert grabbed one of the pencils. Right quickly, said the bird. Go and tell the Samiad to fulfill the last wish of the phoenix and return instantly. Robert, wishing to be polite, added the word please. Now, said the phoenix, pin the paper face down to the carpet. The paper was pinned to the carpet, which vanished and returned in the flash of an eye. Then another paper was written, ordering the carpet to take the egg somewhere where it wouldn't be hatched for another two thousand years. The paper being pinned on, the carpet hastily rolled itself up round the egg, and both vanished forever from the nursery of the house in Camden Town. Oh dear, said everybody. Bear up, said the bird. Do you think I don't suffer being parted from my precious new laid egg like this? Come, conquer your emotions and build my fire. Oh, cried Robert suddenly, I can't bear you to go. The phoenix perched on his shoulder and rubbed its beak softly against his ear. Farewell, Robert of my heart. I have loved you well. The fire had burnt to a red glow. One by one the spices and sweet woods were laid on it. Some smelt nice, and some smelt worse than you would think possible. Farewell, farewell, said the phoenix in a faraway voice. Goodbye, said everyone. Now all were in tears. The bright bird fluttered seven times round the room and settled in the hot heart of the fire. The sweet gums and spices and woods flared and flickered around it, but its golden feathers did not burn. It seemed to grow red hot to the very inside heart of it, and then before the eyes of its friends it fell together a heap of white ashes, and the flames of the cedar pencils and the sandalwood box met and joined above it. "'Whatever have you done with the carpet?' asked Mother next day. "'We gave it to someone who wanted it very much. The name began with a P,' said Jane. The others instantly hushed her. "'Oh, well, it wasn't worth tuppence,' said Mother. "'The person who began with a P said we shouldn't lose by it,' Jane went on before she could be stopped.' 
I dare say, said Mother, laughing. But that very night, a great box came addressed to the children by all their names. Inside was almost everything lovely that you can think of. Toys, games, books, chocolates, and all the presents they had always wanted to give to father and mother, only they never had the money for them. At the very bottom of the box was a tiny golden feather. No one saw it but Robert, and he picked it up and hid it in the breast of his jacket, which had been so often the nesting place of the golden bird. When he went to bed, the feather was gone. It was the last he ever saw of the phoenix. Pinned to the lovely cloak that Mother had always wanted was a paper, and it said, In return for the carpet, with gratitude, P. You may guess how Father and Mother talked it over, but the children knew that this was the fulfilment, by the powerful Samiad, of the last wish of the phoenix, and that this glorious and delightful boxful of treasures was really the very, very, very end of the phoenix and the carpet.